Snyder & Associates podcast series, a civil engineering planning and design firm focused on thinking beyond engineering to improve the quality of life within the communities we serve. The hosts of this episode are Rich Volker and Mark Parrington. All right. Thank you for joining us today. We're talking about multimodal safety considerations. Safety is always forefront to a lot of the projects that we do. Walk us through some things to consider from a safety perspective when introducing pedestrians and bicyclists into different classifications of corridors between local streets, collectors and arterials. What comes up in your mind? Things to consider. I think it is a challenge for us then when we start to talk about a higher classification roadway, an arterial road that may have less driveway points and less land use density around it. There's still great corridors for the mobility. And it's kind of like both modes get a little separated from each other as you're in those corridors, as you just get farther apart. So then it can become that presence of mind of I'm going along a very busy high speed road on a side path and I'm not thinking about traffic as much because I haven't even had to interfere with it. However, when we get to those points of conflict intersections, that's what always becomes a challenge of how we have to treat that so that we make sure both users start to become aware of each other again and visibility is good. We minimize the conflict in the features as we put the corridors together. Describe for me, if you will, what the term complete streets means to you, whether it's context sensitive design or complete streets. Once a term like that is thrown out, oftentimes it'll mean different things to different people. When it comes to fulfilling the process of development and making sure that it meets a complete streets consideration, what does that mean in the work that you do? Sometimes you just can't make it all fit within a certain corridor. It is important that we start from that point of all modes, but quite often it's recognizing when it is okay to say we just can't fit that in. It's important we start from that point and asking that question of how do we do it, but it's having a recognition that Sometimes we just can't accommodate everybody. We make sure to try to look at it in a bigger system approach rather than just this street, this highway. I think that's the key to it, is that we always start and ask ourselves, are we trying to accommodate all modes as best we can in a complete system? Then from there, working into what can we get done? Because again, we go back to the limited resources, the limited budget, or that limited right-of-way problem. Sometimes we can create a bigger problem when we try to put too much into one corridor. We might be having an unintended consequence of crash potential or safety risk. One of the things that I tend to think about is also considering the hierarchy of what the corridor is intended to provide. We did one project in a college campus setting, and it was very interesting how we turned the normal hierarchy of roadway design completely upside down where the most important thing in this corridor is pedestrians. The second most important thing is bicycles. The third most important thing is transit. And the least important thing is cars. <laughs> it's also a good example of a way to describe complete streets. It's how you're making your decisions. You have certain goals for your project. You have constraints to work within. Okay, now what are you going to use for decision making? What is important that this corridor provides? When we zero in a little bit more on bicycle accommodation, there's been evolution of bike accommodation on roadways, starting with just painting a solid white line, calling it a bike lane, giving them a little bit of room at the gutter line, and calling that bike accommodation. What we come to find out is there's a perceived safety as well that lends itself to different types of accommodation. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? When we start talking about complete streets multimodal is we are dealing with quite a variety of vehicle shapes, whether that vehicle is just a person walking or maybe skateboarding. They don't really have a lot of protection. It's important that we understand and we work with that context. That's something I think we try very hard to do for the clients we are working with. Again, I think the public's recognition of something and how they deal with it, as well as the user of some of these facilities, it's important to us when we bring that all back around to the safety of how we do these things, of how we think it fits the context of the area, it fits the context of the users in their understanding. 
And at times, yes, newer things will catch on and people will start to behave differently. But it is important because even as we look at things and we keep our eyes and ears open to things we see nationally, I think many would admit if you're talking about our Midwestern area here, but then say compare it to very bike rich areas, an example like Portland, or just very heavy bicycling community, there's kind of a different recognition and acceptance by vehicles. It's how we take things like that and make sure if we're going to try certain things like that, we make them the right fit for the communities and areas we're dealing with here in the Midwest. There's also the type of bike accommodations that we get into with shared use lanes. And then most recently, we've been into the experimental process on the advisory bike lanes. And everybody else, I'd be curious as to when do you think that shared use is appropriate? Because with the shared use marking, there's a little more flexibility when you talk about the courtesy of how cars pass the bike on the street and how much room there is and how much perceived safety there is. Talk a little bit about what some might consider lesser accommodations, but can actually be quite functional and safe. I think some of these shared concepts that we've talked about, they're very appropriate where, again, we run into into the budget issues that we have. At times, we're dealing with maybe community areas where reality is it's an older area. And unfortunately, it may have gone through a time period in which infrastructure wasn't being installed. Uh, There weren't storm sewers being installed and sidewalk being installed as they build as an example, in residential and building the homes, the reality for us can be, well, you could try to put in trail or more bike lane or other things like that. But some of that may just require a lot of infrastructure, which in turn causes a lot of dollars. And it could be the whole reason that it just doesn't happen at all. I think our approach is signing and marking in this example. It can be an excellent one in that you can still accomplish some goals to provide accommodation And again, that point alluded to earlier of, you know, just kind of the awareness of having those markings and signs out there to say, it isn't going to be this one-off, you might encounter a bicyclist out here. This is space that is intended to be for pedestrians, for bicyclists, and so on as you're driving your vehicle down the road. It's that awareness that I'm sharing this corridor with other modes of transportation, and I need to be heads up to it. Let's talk a little bit more about streets, collector or arterial and up from there, more major corridors that have some level of bike accommodation on them. When we come to the intersections, why don't you talk a little bit about intersection treatments and how the bikes factor into that from both a control and from a safety perspective. If I'm biking and I'm riding up to a signal and I see a little marking on the bike lane that says bicycle, like there's a loop there, is that just making me feel good or is there actually something there to detect me? Bike boxes gets you out there where it puts the bicyclist in a greater viewing point for any drivers and vehicles, as well as allows bicyclists to get in a point where they can better see and judge what type of vehicle activity is going on, what type of conflict could be approaching. If we're talking about bicyclists, most people out there on a bike, even the fearless know if they decide to take the risk and take on a motorized vehicle coming down the road, well, you kind of know the laws of physics and what's going to go wrong if that happens. It's important, even if it is a side path on a very busy corridor, We bring them to an intersection. We give them an opportunity to see vehicular traffic that's out in travel lanes when they make a decision, like if they are at a signalized intersection and waiting for that moment. But we have things like right turn on red that can lead to conflict. Drivers and cars are negotiating a lot of things as they're trying to understand when they can do what they want to do, make a certain turning movement. And it's adding another element in there for the bicyclist, their ability to also see those vehicles clearly and be seen. That's an important thing. And it can get in those context things where perhaps with an intersection beyond some of the specifics they were mentioning, maybe we were at more of a trail crossing type place, features, rectangular rapid flash and beacons, things like that that might suggest heads up to the motorists that bicyclists may be present coming across. But it also is kind of a key opportunity to provide bicyclists as a point where they can make sure, okay, can I see everything well so that I can go ahead and make this crossing maneuver? Both people traveling down the road, down a trail, down a path, whatever it may be, they've got equal interests in their mind as to where they're trying to go, how fast they're trying to get there. 
they're just trying to do that safely at the end of the day. So a lot of key things for us when we look at an intersection, we may want to do things with some raised islands or other things to separate, to provide, maybe we break a crossing up into two or three movements to get a pedestrian or bicyclist across a big, busy intersection. I mean, just because you have a large intersection doesn't mean you can't get these other modes of travel through that intersection in a safe and efficient manner. It's just all that give and take that we have to put into our intersection designs or corridor designs to balance everything out. All the Midwestern states have fairly significant trail systems going in, and that's also a favored bicycle accommodation in metro areas is to when you have a trail route that you'll end up with a side path accommodation. Talk a little bit about the challenges that come in when you're getting to a signalized intersection of accommodating a side path safely. I think the physical nature of how we lay out some of these side paths, sometimes we're very lucky in that we have a large corridor right away because we are dealing with a highway route, a higher speed, and so we've got a lot of room. We tend to locate the side path. We have it back at the edge of the right-of-way line, which is great. It makes for an enjoyable experience. Speaking as a bicyclist, I enjoy it. Get out there and you're able to get moving. But I think what we do in reference to the comments about when you approach the intersection is it's as simple as us just putting a little bit of realignment in that trail to then pull it up tighter into the intersection. Sometimes we see things with side paths that get built and you know, just kind of, oh, the side path is 25 feet away from the edge of the road. We just keep barreling it all the way through the corridor the same way. It may even just be a smaller, lesser intersection that's just a stop sign, but you can kind of create this situation where that path, if you just let it go parallel and cross it back farther, it may be at a point that puts it in a bit of an awkward situation as to awareness. For those approaching the intersection, they see a stop sign ahead, but the trail's in advance of it, and so the crossing, and so they're not thinking about it, and that can lead to conflict. Or for the person exiting, you're on a high-speed roadway, and you've just finally found a gap and made your left turn, the way you're looking as you're driving a vehicle, you're worried about a different direction than maybe where the bicycle might be coming from. My example there is someone turning left and they may be so glad they just finally got a gap can make their vehicle maneuver. And then if that trail isn't, it's a little farther back, not where they're expecting, or again, just that pure what's in your cone of vision, it's just not in a location where you may be aware of the bicycle and it can catch the vehicle off guard. It's just subtle things like that as we're designing intersections where the side path, that's the way we can have this big, large core that accommodates all these modes. But when we bring it to these intersection points, well, guess where we have the conflict? When we start crossing over everybody's path, it can be little things like that as simple as, well, let's let's put a little curve in that trail and tuck it up closer to the road for that crosswalk, for that cross bike. We develop something like that. Again, it gets everything to where it's in everybody's focal point of what they're looking at in their cone of vision. So just little things like that can mean a big difference in what we're doing. I think we've covered quite a bit of ground. I thank you for your input today. Is there any one takeaway that you'd like folks to hear about from your perspective when it comes to multimodal safety considerations? I think looking at everything right up front as best you can in a design project. And again, we take in a lot of information, a lot of data when we're designing a corridor or an intersection. And the same thing would apply to the complete streets and the multimodal. We have to take a good look at it and make sure that we're approaching it from the standpoint of what do we believe, if we don't have the users yet, what will the end users be? And if we do have the users out, we're making sure we take a good, they're already in the corridor, we're taking a good look at that and how the behavior and how things have been impacted so far. Again, if we just stick to kind of standard templates and cookie cutter, if you will, things aren't going to be different with it. We have to take a look at that, just like we may examine, well, how many trucks and how big are the trucks going through an intersection? Are we asking ourselves, this is really a case where we're dealing with some other modes of transportation with pedestrians and bicyclists. Are we approaching it appropriately in the way we're addressing those? The one thing that I think we talk about with safety, and we're dealing with cars, trucks, a lot of times we deal with crash frequency that's related to some plastic on the road. But unfortunately, given the mix and size of when you go from 
non-motorized user up to a vehicle, a truck, a bus, we know that the conflict typically isn't going to be good if there truly is a crash. And so that's what's paramount in our minds when we're talking about safety. You don't always have the frequency of pedestrian and bicycle crashes, but when you do, unfortunately, the outcomes tend not to be good. That's what we have to keep in the forefront of our mind when we're looking at projects and planning efforts for our communities. Thanks for all your time today, guys. Also, thanks to those listening. Be sure to reach out to us. If you do have areas of concern or things you want to get going from a planning perspective, it's a really good exercise to go through a detailed planning process to line out how you want your community to function when it comes to the safety of other modes in your transportation system. With that, we'll wrap this up for today and safe travels. Thank you for listening to Snyder & Associates podcast series, a civil engineering planning and design firm focused on thinking beyond engineering to improve quality of life within the communities we serve. Find related content to this episode on snyder-associates.com.